chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Now about the collection for the Lord's people, you did great. do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Grace. Good morning again, and welcome to Redeemer Lincoln Square. We've been looking at cultural narratives that we've unknowingly absorbed as true. Our culture has a a set of particular assumptions and values that are latent inside of key themes that move the imagination of our culture collectively and you individually about uh, happiness, about justice, about love, about identity and freedom and, and power and more. And unless we are aware of them, we're going to unknowingly live them out. Now, some of you are going to say, well, what's wrong with that? So what? That we're part of this culture. That's who we are. But if you should not blindly believe in Christianity, then you should not blindly believe in your cultural assumptions in case you end up doing more harm than good through them. Therefore, we are trying to look at them in this series. And today we're going to look at the cultural narrative of justice. The the word justice, if you go to Google Trends, which is a website that shows you kind of how a word's been used over time in history, the word justice is being used now more than ever before. Who doesn't love justice? Who doesn't want that? The small problem that we have, though, is that everybody, even though the word justice seems to be clear, everybody has a different definition of it. Harvard professor Michael Sandel, in his book on justice, shows that there are actually competing views of justice that are not compatible. So we have to now ask, okay, well, which view is actually the right view? And this is important, right, because cultural uh, current events, you have Palestine versus Israel, you have, if you go to India, you have the Muslim versus Hindus, you have historically Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, you have in America, uh, you have Caucasian and and African Americans, and this is just a couple things. There's injustices that are happening in and and around your life and in the world, and we have to ask, how are we going to get justice? The hurts are deep, the conflict is on repeat, and we have to ask, Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian here today, how will we get justice? So let's look at three things in our text today. Let's look at the messy modern definitions of justice, the messy modern views of justice. Let's look at the biblical basis for justice and then our only hope for justice. I'll say it again, the messy modern views of justice, the biblical basis for real justice, and then our only hope. So first, our messy modern views of justice. Go to our text. And we've been in Paul's letter, first letter to the, to the Corinthians. And we've been doing this because even though our narratives, our narratives today are modern, what we're finding is actually these are not new ideas. Paul, in his letter, is dealing with every single one of the same ones that we deal with. And today we get to the very last chapter. He's wrapping up the end of his letter. And as he's wrapping it up, he's reminding the Corinthian church, that he's, gonna, he's collecting funds on behalf of the poor in Jerusalem. This is all in verse 3. In other of his letters, he goes more specifically in the poverty of, of those in Jerusalem. But he says, hey, I'm collecting funds on behalf of the poor. And as a, as a Jewish man, Paul believed in shalom, which is putting all things right, to do justice, putting all things right in the world. And Certainly there's more to it than just collecting funds. But for now, we just need to notice that he assumed everybody should do it. If you look at verse uh, 1, he says, do what I told the Galatian church. Do what I told all the other churches. And if you go in the other letters, he has the same themes. Now, New Yorkers, we believe in justice too. We think it's the right thing to do. We get in trouble, though, the minute we say, how? How will we do it? As soon as we have to say, Here's how to do justice, we get in trouble because of the different definitions. I'll give you some examples. For, one, for instance, the old libertine view of justice says that justice is to create a society 
where you are free as individuals to make the choices you want. If you want to be free from, to, to buy and sell, if you want to be free to, uh, from the shackles of other people speaking into your life, then freedom, in the libertarian view, is low government, uh, low taxes, low uh, um, regulation, because in this view, justice is fairness. And this sounds good, though, but if you listen closely, it downplays the idea that there are social forces that actually cause some people to have less choices and freedoms than others. It stresses individual action, but at the cost of understanding how we're actually formed communally. Growing up, um, my parents were readers. They read all the time, and so uh, anytime I was bored, the minute I was bored and I wanted a wine and said, I'm bored, you know what was thrust in my hand? Lord of the Rings. Um, it, you know, I was bored. Here's Chronicles of Narnia. And um, I, so I ended up growing up being a reader as well. Because why? But not because I naturally was this. It was because the community around me pushed it and formed me through this. Uh, and as, what, what's, what's come up now is a study has, has shown that if you are just read, if you, sorry, if you just read to your children, I was read as a child growing up. If you just read to your child as they enter kindergarten, they actually enter kindergarten with 1.4 million more words than other kids. With a, with a higher vocabulary then, you can read and write better, you can actually do math better. And so I actually had social structures that, uh, I had social structures around me that allowed me to have an edge over other kids in my same class. So the libertarian view says justice is just individual fairness, but it can't take into account things like that that are happening. And so this is why many people have gone to the other side of the spectrum. We've gone to the other side and said, well, okay, justice can't be just equal opportunity. Instead, if we're going to really fix things, we need to create a space where there's equal outcomes. I was playing uh, a board game with um, one, a couple of my kids. I only have two, so I guess both of them. Um, <laughs> this is a couple of weeks ago. And I was winning over and over and over again. And, and one of my children said, you know what, Dad? Can you just at least let us win? At least, like, can, can, I mean, can you at least... Can we change the rules so that actually we win some of the times? Because that would be great. And I was like, but that's not fair. It's not fair to change the rules. And they're like, well, don't tell us about fairness. Fairness, you are older. You've played this game longer. You know how to actually win at it. Don't push your libertarian equal opportunity. <laughs> no, they, they didn't say that part. But they did say, and I think a lot of other people are saying the same thing, which is the only way we're going to fix things is if we change the rules. And of course, then that takes away individual culpability. And then you end up having inequality only because of social structures. I think that's actually why you're seeing play out in society on social media. There's this race for everybody to say they're the victim. When, you're, when somebody points out and says, hey, you're an oppressor, you've oppressed me, guess what no, no, nobody ever does? Nobody says, yeah, you're right, that's me, I'm the oppressor. Have you noticed that? Nobody, when they're accused individually or corporately, nobody says, yes, that's who I am. No. Almost always they say, actually, no, we're the victims. You're actually wrong about that. And it keeps going back and forth this way. So instead, everybody's trying to do this. So zoom out for a second. On the one hand, the libertarian view of justice overemphasizes the individual and ignores the social forces that are around us. But the, on the other spectrum, you have a view of justice that basically overemphasizes the social forces and underemphasizes in any kind of individual agency. And so what's going on is we love this word justice. We're throwing it around everywhere, and everybody wants it. And I, I think we all do, if we're really honest. We want justice. And yet, because of, of, of these different definitions, justice doesn't come. And between these two polls, there's so many other v versions, nobody agrees. And so you have liberal justice people saying, our view is right. And then you have conservative justice people saying, our view is right. And they're literally talking past each other as they have different assumptions about how to actually get it. Nobody has the biblical view of justice. And so it, the cycle goes on and on and on. We're, getting, it, it, we're growing further and further apart, and things are getting worse and not better. That's what we're in right now. What do we do? Well, before we move on, if you're not a Christian, this is what I want to ask you. What I want to ask you is this. How will the cycles 
of retaliation and violence and brokenness stop? What's going to stop it? How will, you, how, how, how will it ever end? If you think the answer is, well, you know, somebody will eventually win, look at history. That never happens, right? And when somebody wins, then there's still always another group, and then it keeps going on and on and on. Right? If somebody hurts somebody, the other group then feels validated to retaliate, and then they hurt the other group back the way that they were hurt. And the other group says, well, then you hurt me, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. It never stops. How are you going to end violence? You have to answer that question. If you are a Christian, I think what I want to ask you is this. Where have you potentially unknowingly participated in hurting others because of your view of justice or non-view? Because you you're like, you, you basically acquiesce and say, I don't need to know. Where have you maybe, as a Christian, where have you unknowingly adopted one of these modern definitions where you either overemphasized the individual at the cost of the collective, or you overemphasize the collective at the cost of the individual agency, and that creates more brokenness. And where, where have we done that? I think we, we owe it to ourselves and to this world to kind of ask those hard questions. That's point one. All right, now point two then. If modern views of justice are too simplistic, then what's the biblical basis for justice? I, I think we have to ask that question. Then what is it? And it, we'll look in our text. Paul gives us what I would say two roots for biblical justice. First, notice Paul does not want this gift to just be mailed. This is in verse, verse 2. He goes, when I come and make no collections, look at verse 3. When I arrive, I'm going to give you letters to introduce you. In other words, he's assuming you're going to take it. Why is he doing that? He does that because he wants to enable face-to-face -face relationship between race and class and uh, cultural divide, because the money is about to go to a different geographical space, to a different class, to a dif different ethnicity, and he's saying, don't just send it out, I want you to go with them. Because he realizes and knows that biblical justice is not just an economic thing. I think we get too simplistic in our modern space where we, everything just comes down to physical, tangible stuff. And Paul says, no, there's more to justice, because there's more to you as a person. Last year in the scientific journal Nature, a massive study was published. Over 72 million people were studied between the ages of 25 and 44, and they were looking for the key factors that get people out of poverty. And you know what they found? The number one factor that gets people out of poverty, it's cross-class relationships. It's people who are actual friends across classes. Now, of course, Paul already knew that, right? From this text, he knew it was personal relationships. He knew that for the restoration of a, of a poor community, it was going to be a lot more than just funds. It was going to take the deep complexity of personal, human friendships and relationships. That's the first root of biblical justice. Now, the second root that we see in the text, it's a little more hidden, but it's in the first verse when he talks about, I'm taking up the collection for the Lord's people. In the ESV, it's translated as saints, the, the saints. The word lords, is, it means saints. Now, why would Paul use this, this word that is spiritual and, and puts this sort of eternal connotation around humankind? I think the answer is because he knows people are more than just physical stuff. Tom Holland, not the actor, but the historian, wrote this book called Dominion. This is a couple years ago. And he was trying to trace out the origins of Western civilization. You know what he found? Greco-Roman society did not value the poor. In fact, the poor were despised. The very culture the Corinthians grew up in, their whole life, they despised the poor. The, this is, this is a, a direct quote. He says, the heroes of the Iliad scorned the weak and the downtrodden. And yet, he points out, every week people in the Roman culture at churches were giving funds for the poor. It was, in Western civilization, it was the Christians who built the hospitals. It was the Christians who uh, gave money away to the poor. It was the Christians who, uh, Bishop Gregory of Nyssa was the first figure in history to say that slavery was wrong. And what that means is this, is that ju the justice values today that we have did not just evolve out of nowhere. The idea of human rights and justice came specifically from 
Christians who saw people as eternal and spiritual, as made in the image of God. Now, does that mean that you have to be a Christian to believe in human rights? No, of course you can. Everybody does that. But what it does mean is you do not have the foundation from which it came from. True story. A friend of mine was a resident, medical resident. He was doing his psychiatric uh, rounds, I think is what it's called. Um, and he was with other students. And at one point, they got to a case of a person who was, you know, he was uh, committed. He was in because he was depressed and he had all these self-hating thoughts and he didn't want to live. And as these residents were sitting around trying to figure out what to do, one resident said this. He said, well, what we have to do is we have to show him that he's a valuable person. What we have to do is show him that he's not trash as he's saying. He's not nothing. He's important and valuable. And what's interesting is, is the doctor that was over these residents, you know what he said? He said this. He said, how do you know humans are valuable? We're scientists. What scientific basis do you have for saying that? You can't actually prove that. And even though the residents were a little bit disappointed in this answer, they had to admit that, yeah, that's a value. And Tom Holland shows that that value comes through Christianity. So take the homeless in New York City. Housing insecurity last year went up 18%. That now it's, the, the, the record says there's over 100,000 people that have housing insecurity in New York City alone. There's, it's probably much higher than that. Many of them are children. Now, liberal justice people will say, well, it's all because of uh, inequity in the system. And conservative justice people will say, well, it's all because somebody somewhere, some individual made the wrong decision. Somebody, it was all their individual culpability. And yet biblical justice comes in here and fuses these fragmented social versions, roots it in actually human relationships that are made spiritually and wonderfully in the image of God, which means people have individual agency and importance, and yet there are still systemic, structural powers at play. It brings all the versions of justice and completes them. So go back to our text. When, when Paul says you need to uh, set aside funds, notice he says something. He says, as you're prospering. Do you see that phrase in here? As you prosper. Do what I told the Galatian church to do. At, at saving it up. And it means as you prosper. Why? Biblical justice is this. Disadvantage yourself to advantage other images of God. And so prospering means you're advantaging, right? But he's saying as you prosper, disadvantage yourself to advantage other images of God. No other view has that view. No other view actually combines these things. And says, yes, there's systemic injustice, and yet I want you to do it holistically through people and individuals, calling them to integrity and honor and character. And so before we move on, this is what I want to ask, because you're know, like, this is all very heady. Michael's doing all these different versions. So here, let me make it really simplistic. Why are you here in New York? See, I'm, making it, I'm applying it to you. Why are you actually here? Did you come here just to prosper financially? Did you grow up here and you stayed here because of the comfort of the relationships around you. See, it's fine if you prosper. I hope you do. But it, you're supposed to look around the brokenness around us and say, how can I be a restorative presence to the people around me? Because if you don't, then you've missed what it means to be a Christian in, in Paul's view. That instead of thinking, where can I go to be comfortable, a Christian is supposed to live out the, the purpose and meaning of being a Christian is to say, how can I be a restorative presence in the space that I'm in? Where's the place that I can be the most restorative presence? I think a lot of folks, they, they leave the city sometimes to raise their kids. They say, I need to go to a place where it's a better place to raise their kids. I don't think there's any other place, better place to raise your kids than in a place where, that needs restorative presence, which is right here in New York. So we need to ask ourselves, what's going to bring shalom today? See, I think a lot of times we ask ourselves, what am I going to have for lunch <laughs> This afternoon, that's what you're thinking. You're thinking about how, what am I gonna, how am I going to get my job done tomorrow? How am I going to get these things done? And those are fine questions uh, in the day-to-day. -day, but I'm asking you the bigger question. Why are we here? And what are we about? How can I disadvantage myself to advantage others? Notice that phrase, that language, it's not liberal. It's not conservative. Paul will not be pigeonholed into our political 
uh, truncated dichotomies. This is biblical justice, and if you don't think and act this way, you're unjust. Why? Because the Bible is clear. You're either part of being a restorative presence or you're actually part of being a destructive presence. You're either working for healing or you're working for hurting. So ask yourself, which one are you? Because to do justice means taking all that you are and it means living lives that disadvantage, as we disadvantage ourselves to advantage others, we're in their lives. It's being on mission, not for ourselves, but for others. And so will you do that? Will you do that with us? Are you doing that? If you want a solution to the problems, people go, oh, I want, the, I want a solution. How do we get justice here? This is it. This is the solution. It's right here. It's reframe your life to be a restorative presence in your job, in your families, in your communities, with your neighbors, with your family members, that person that's down that street, that person you really didn't want to talk to today. But if you did, you'd bring joy and gladness and restoration in our lives. All right, last point. What's our only hope? I showed you how the modern definition of justice don't quite work. I gave you the roots of biblical justice. But what's our only hope? Go back to the text. And I find it kind of funny. I don't want to make, it, make too light of it. But I find it fascinating that Paul tells, in this whole letter, he's telling these people what's wrong with them. And then he says, by the way, I'm coming around to raise now money from you all. And I want you to give money to the very people that you despised your whole life. Oh, and by the way, you're going to take that money to them yourself. I mean, imagine you were them. You're gonna, are you going to be like, yippee, I can't wait? No. I could stand up here and tell you, wave the finger at you and say, do justice. And I could tell you, oh, I could preach many sermons on this. It won't mean anything if I just keep doing it that way because I can't jury, you can't jury rig the heart to not prioritize itself. You can't. At the end of the day, we're still going to prioritize ourselves. And we all do it, me included. So what's our hope? Go back to verse 2, and there's this little phrase that we pass over on the first day of the week. Nobody gives any, you know, two thoughts on this, but we really should. The first day of the week, what's he referring to here? The first day of the week was when Christians decided to start worshiping their Lord and Creator. Because they wanted to actually say, this is going to be... The thing that sets the, the agenda, it's going to set actually how I view the rest of my life. Instead of doing it at the end, they moved it to the beginning. And what they were doing there is they were saying, I'm going to worship the one who loved and saved me, Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He suffered injustice. As a, someone who was poor, he went through a fake trial, through fake accusations. He had every single injustice of the world land on him on that cross. This past week, I was looking at a testimony of an African American woman who was enslaved, who was beaten, who saw lynchings every day of family members, other people in her life. And she was writing this memoir about how, why did I actually stay a Christian? Who a lot of the people who were hurting her were Christians too. And she said it was very simple is that Jesus was lynched. Jesus suffered injustice. She said, I can't believe in a God who's out there and distant and kind of leaving us to do whatever. She's like, no, Jesus didn't just die for me. He died with me, going through the very same things that I've gone through. And so that means that you might forget him, but he's never going to forget you. He's gone into the broken, systemic structures of oppression, was executed, took on the condemnation that we deserved so that we could get the justice that he deserved. He takes on injustice so we can have it. And when he was resurrected on the third day, what we're doing on Sunday today is we're celebrating today so so it can set the rest of our week. That's what it means by saying on the first day of the week. And so this is what's key. This is it. The key, if you really are the recipient of God's grace, through Jesus now we can actually give grace because to extend grace to others, it first has to be extended to you. And this is how it works. People who are given grace always give grace. People who feel love always move out in love. Because the beauty of his love for you changes your heart towards other people. I can't jury rig your heart. I can't just point the bony finger. But you know what could happen? If you let yourself sit in the love and grace and heart that he had for you, 
that the cosmic God of the universe in the person of Jesus said, you know what, the only way I'm going to fix the injustice of the world is to actually bear them myself. And the injustice that you do too. Done to you and done through you. On the cross he pays for it. And because of that, what now happens is, guess what? You and I can't be indifferent anymore, can we? Why? If he died, though he didn't owe anything to me, now if you make that the core of who you are, though other people don't, owe, you don't owe anything to them, you're going to die for them. Right? If you were poor in spirit, how can you despise the poor? If you were, if, if, if you were hurt, if you were needy, how can you despise the needy? If you were actually the one who was lost, how can you walk by anybody out there and say, well, I'm going to, even though you're lost. You can, you're not. You're not going to do it. Some of you will be like, yeah, 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 but Christians, we, here's what you're going to say. You're going to say, Christians have done terrible things to people in the name of Christ, right? And people have, but I would argue that it's not because they actually were too much of a Christian. It's because they weren't Christian enough. Because to be Christian enough, if you take the core, of, the core of Christianity is a man who dies for his enemies. And if you make that the core of who you are, I promise you, you're not going to move out in spite and hate. You'll move out differently. And as you realize that the Lord of creation didn't just die for you, but he wanted to. He, he looked at you and somehow said, this person is worth it. You're not going to be so filled with love and gratitude. You're not, it, it's going to be a natural thing. That's why it's so hard. Yes, it's obedience. Yes, you should do it. But boning, pointing the bony finger is not going to do it. But it being such a like, I, I'm free to do this now. I don't have to be shackled to my job for that approval. I don't have to be shackled to my family members for that, for the neediness of my heart. I, I've been so filled with his love, I can move out. Last thing I want to say, just, I was try, I'm trying to be as practical as possible. What if today we just didn't rush out? What if we looked at each other and said, who are you? Nice to meet you. What if we did that to our neighbors? What if we went to people who, I, we, who need restorative presence and we w were that to them? Guess what it would cost you? It would, by the way, it's going to cost you your time, your energy, your money. You will have to disadvantage yourself, but you, by doing so, you'll advantage others and justice will be done. Please take that time, but only because of the overflowing joy of the grace of the cross, the gospel of grace that moves into your life as that joy wells up in us because you couldn't, but he could. Because you wouldn't, but he would. When you know that in your heart, you can live it out. I remember a time when this first hit me. It was in college. I was in my dorm room. I grew up in a Christian home. I, I, I heard story after story, but it was finally, it just sort of it broke through that all the stories in the Bible were I, what I had to do to try hard and be good and then God loves me. No, they were depictions of ways that the Lord of creation was coming after me. And when that hit, the grace welled up to be able to say, I want to move out in dis different and profound ways. I know some of you right now are, are experiencing terrible injustices. So it's really hard to think this way when you're, you've, you're hurting. Know that you have a Lord who didn't just suffer for you but with you. Some of you are going through really hard marriages right now. Some of you are moving out in, in weakness right now. What I would like to say to you, the last thing I want to say is get grace because it leads to justice. Which sounds weird, doesn't it? It's actually ironic because grace is when justice isn't applied to you. You're, given off, you're let off, and that's what happens with Jesus. It landed on him. But as you get that grace, as that wells up in your heart, you're going to move out in justice. Modern views of justice can't do that, but this can. Friends, you love people the most when you feel loved the most, and there is no other place in the universe that has as much love as this. Let that move in our hearts. Let that be setting us forward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, true justice fell on you. I think we can't even fathom the cross. We can't fathom the Trinitarian nature of, of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And at, at some point, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whatever physical suffering pales in comparison to the injustice of it all, for you to die and you, Father, were blameless. You experienced ultimate injustice. And I just pray that we, Father, see our culpability. We, 
our hearts move. We like some of these modern definitions because they make us feel better about ourselves. And at the end of the day, we always give ourselves the out clause. Help us to see we are the ones who are in need. We're the ones that are out, but you brought us in. And so now we can bring everybody, we can bring as many people in. I know we get, some of us in this room get so flustered with the complexity now. If it's not all systemic, it's not all individual, which one is it? Help us just to do the things that you put before us. One step at a time to love and serve and care as you loved and served and cared for us. Amen.